name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So, I actually want to, with all the recent events that are going on in, in this country, the, the one that really has hit home to me that I've kind of followed up a little bit on, um, is the issue right now at the Supreme Court on whether or not gay marriages are going to be recognized by the country. And, and they heard everything last month and now they are in their chambers talking about it, you know, among their, the different justices. And, and what I read is that probably by the end of this month, usually the last week of the month, they release, you know, their decisions. And this is a decision that has implications like across the United States, not just for, for, for Christian churches, but it really shatters and ripples the fabric of this country. And it's an important issue. And as I was kind of reading up on it, of course, like whenever you Google search something to see like what's new, like you get a bunch of different news clips of people who give their two cents on an issue like this. And I came across a news clip um, earlier this week, and I'll be honest, it's been bothering me all week long. And um, I'm actually going to show a clip of it, and, and I'll give you the premise. So also, like, as, as the Supreme Court is dealing or discussing a, about this issue right now, um, also, the presidential elections, they're all gearing up. Different people are announcing. And so as people, you know, different... Uh, potential candidates for the presidency are, are announcing their election, they're having to address certain issues. And so one of the new people who's starting to run, Mark Rubio, I think a senator from Florida, um, made a comment saying that with this issue being at the Supreme Court and the potential implications of a ruling in favor of recognizing gay marriages as a constitution, like a constitutional recognition of, of gay marriage, Okay, that he says Christianity is under attack, that our ability to say what we believe is now being termed as hate speech. So that was his point, okay? And so they, they took a clip of this, and these five people on Fox News, and I think the, the whole sitcom is called The Five, and they sit here and they debate things, okay? guy all the way at the very end sitting at, he's the one I'm going to focus on so we're going to play a little clip of what he his input on gay marriages and the constitutionalization of gay marriages I'm going to play his little clip for just for it's like a minute or so mm -hmm. great this take the state out of it and that actually assures your religious liberty she's all okay. right uh, Greg your this response guy. on that idea and Christianity under attack I think uh, what uh, Rubio said he believes um, that if you have these beliefs, there are people who will say you're a homophobe. I'm not sure, so certain that this is purely a religious thing and more so a generational thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think the older you are, the more likely you're reluctant to deal with, to uh, uh, appreciate gay marriage, perhaps because you've been religious longer. But the point is, how do you meet halfway at this point? Because the fact is, it's happening and it's not going away. There is going to be gay marriage. Uh, whether you want gay marriage to be a major issue as a candidate, it's not up to you. It's being pushed mainly by the media and the academic complex. So you have to learn to use it against the left. Gay marriage, in my opinion, is a conservative idea. Uh, the left generally hates traditions. It's all about breaking with traditions. And in this case, this is embracing a tradition, one that stabilizes a community, one that is valuable for families. Uh, why would you exclude that from a group of people who are born that way? If they are born that way, the idea that you are saying you cannot be part of this, that's an exclusive belief. And, I, and as somebody who is not religious, who has been but not, I was under the impression that faith should be inclusive. And I think that it's a, it's a mistake at this point to say that faith, uh, there's a place in your faith to make this work. And we all know this because we all have, we all know families in which you have the religious, you have the religious members and you have the gay members and they overlap. It actually works on a family level, on a local level. So let's not make it a national thing. Okay. Let's I've learn never, to work I've together. Never, it, Monsignor Gutfeld. So there's a lot to talk about with what he said. 
And the point of, of today is not, I don't want to sit here and pick at everything he said because there's a lot. Like, we, like I, I personally disagree with a lot. And I think as a Christian, I disagree with a lot of what he said. But this is the reality of the life and the society that we live in. And these are conversations that you have at work with your co-workers that I have on the street, you know, as I walk and meet different people. These are, this is what's going on in society. And what he's, you know, one of the things that, that he said, which dropped my jaw and has made me think all week long, is that gay marriages are actually a conservative, it's a conservative viewpoint. And then as, as he continued on when he was saying that, um, that actually like if somebody is born this way and they, you know, you know, they should be accepted. And one attack that, that he said was that my impression from the outside is that a faith should be all inclusive, not exclusive. So he was saying, as Christians, if you don't believe in, in gay marriages, you're being exclusive. You're being exclusive. And really, like, shouldn't your faith, your all-loving faith, be very inclusive to everybody? It's a good point. Should we be all-inclusive or should we be exclusive? And are, e are these the terms that we should be using in a situation like this, inclusive versus exclusive. So as I continue to kind of mull over this, I was actually led to another interview. I'm not going to show it. One's enough for, for today. But I was actually led to an interview that happened back in 2012 between Chelsea Clinton and Rick Warren about this issue when it came up. And Rick Warren, you know, when, when Chelsea was pushing this agenda, Rick Warren said something that I liked a lot. And he said, look, Chelsea, everybody in this world has an authority. Everybody in this world has an authority. The question is, who is your authority? He said, who is your authority? All right? Hold on to that thought. We're going to come back to it. All right? Because I want to tie it into the readings of today. And really, the reading of today that I feel ties in with this actually comes from James. In James chapter 5, we read 1 through 8. All right? If we can get it on the screen so people can follow, that'd be great. James chapter 5 says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and you will eat and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last day. So James is pretty much telling his audience that you who lived in a certain way, okay, you who valued gold and silver, and if we read one more verse, indeed the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud. Cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. Okay? So he's talking to his audience and saying, you who are rich, you who hoarded your gold, you who hoarded your silver, you who cheated the people who worked you know, for you, don't worry, your day is coming. Because all things will be revealed. All truth will be revealed. And what we do on earth here to hide truth, to hide certain things, will one day come back. Because the Lord of the Sabbath, when He comes, and He promised that He will come, He will reveal all things, all truth. Nothing that we do can be hidden. No matter how we twist it, how we manipulate it, doesn't matter. Because truth is truth. And truth, by its very definition, excludes things. I can't tell you that my robe right now is black. No, it's white. But I could say, but it's a really, really like, you know, you know, different shade. And you say, no, it's white. Truth is, this is white. Okay? I may try and twist it, but at the last day, God is going to come and say, no, that's white. 
Truth cannot be twisted. Truth is truth. Question is, where do we find our truth? Who do we allow in our lives to speak truth? Where do we derive our truth from? And James tells us that truth will be revealed. There's nothing that is hidden that will not be revealed in the last day. And we will reap the benefits of that. We just hope we're on the right side of truth. So Rick Warren, in his interview, as Chelsea continued to push and say, like, you know what? Well, doesn't the Bible just, like, it has a place? It has, like, a little a place, a corner in society, in life. And he said, no. Everybody has an authority. Everybody has an authority. I have chosen, this is Rick Warren, I'm paraphrasing. Rick Warren said, I have chosen that my authority is the Bible and the truth that Jesus Christ spoke. Other people have different authorities. Other people have the authority, their authority is whatever's popular. Their authority is whatever brings peace. Their authority is whatever makes everybody happy. Everybody has a different authority. But doesn't mean that your authority is right. And so I really question this guy, Mr. Mr. Gutfield, Greg Gutfield is his name. I wonder, like, well, what's his authority? To say that marriage is conservative, to say that religions, okay, that faith should be all-inclusive. Well, at what cost? At the cost of truth? Well, God said, I'm going to come back and I'm going to reveal all truth. So in a world that loves to twist things, in a world that loves to manipulate, in a world that loves us, wants us to think in a certain way, it's important for us as individuals to be rooted and grounded in truth, to ask ourselves, well, really, what authority do I believe in? Who is my authority? Because just because you come to church just because we come to church and participate does not mean that by default my authority is God. My authority, I don't, I wish I could live by all the biblical truth Jesus has given me. But man, I come up short. I cut corners. I'm weak. Some of the things that Jesus says are difficult for me. But just because they're difficult for me doesn't mean I get to manipulate them. I get to change them. I get them to say what I want them to say. Because God says, no, when I come back, I will clarify my authority. It is clear, but I will reinforce and clarify my authority. So it's always a good question for us, and if we can do anything, to look at the, you know, the way we view certain topics in society, the way we, we approach certain things and begin to critically look at the way I approach things, the stance that I have on certain situations and ask myself a question. Based on my stance, who is my authority? Based on my action, what does my action say my authority is? Who do I recognize as my authority? And if I find that my authority is popular belief, if I find my, that my authority is wanting to please everybody, if I find that my authority is anything but biblical, then I found myself in a situation that has deviated from the truth of God. And God's truth will stand. It's the same truth thousands of years ago. It's the same truth thousands of years to come. His truth is transcendent of time. It overcomes all barriers, goes into all cultures. But has it crossed the barrier into our heart? And from our heart comes the way we live, comes the way, the stance we take on certain situations. 
So we are constantly challenged in society on what is truth. And, they, and, and society and, and journalists love to use little terms like inclusive or exclusive. Well, if you don't love me, then you hate me and you're excluding, you're exclusive of me. Say like, okay, well what about, why don't we use the terms like, you know, accepted and approved. I may accept you as a person, but I may not approve of your behavior. Okay, my wife may accept me for who I am, but she may not approve of all the things that I do because I'm a different person than her. It doesn't mean she hates me, she loves me, but she can accept me, but not approve of the things that I do. So society loves to take these terms and twist them in different ways. Are you inclusive? Are you exclusive? Is this hate speech? Are you a phobe? Different things. And all these things challenge our authority. So we ask ourselves, well, where does my authority come from? Who do I declare as the supreme authority? And then we measure them up to biblical truths. Because as a Christian, as Christians, we adhere to the biblical truths that God has laid out for us through his son, Jesus Christ. He was clear about what he believed. So to wrap everything up, we're constantly being challenged. And the best thing we can do for ourselves is to look and say, how do I react? to the different challenges, to the different arguments, to different things and ideas that are floating around me? Do I latch on to one? And if I latch on to one, I got to ask myself, why did I latch on? Who, and, and my latching on, the argument that I use, the things that I said, what does it say about who I declare as the authority over my life? And if it says something different than what Jesus said, we got some homework to do. We got some searching in to do in order to be able to continually through life come closer and closer to the image of being the expressed image of Jesus, which is our goal. The Bible says we go from glory to glory. We slowly over time as we mature in our relationship with God become more like him, an image like him. And he was the fulfillment of truth. So how do we find and come closer to that truth? Well, we've got to look and say, well, how do I act in society? How do I respond to certain things? What words, what terms do I use? What do I believe? Or, and, and what does that say about who I, my authority is? And if my authority is something other than Christ, then I, I know where I need to work. I know the area of my life I need to you know, address. And I conclude with one last verse from the Pauline epistle of today. Pauline epistle of today was talking about, uh, comes from Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. And it was talking about speaking in tongues. And Paul boils it down to one point. He's saying what matters most is that we speak correctly and we speak so that people understand. And he said, if we do those things, this is what happens at the very end. The last verse of today. And thus, the secrets, this is if like somebody walks into the church and truth is spoken to them in a way that relates to them. And this is what happens to that individual who hears truth. And thus, the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so, falling down on his face, he worships God and reports that God is truly among you. When truth is spoken, godly, biblical truth is spoken. The secrets of his heart are revealed. Truth is revealed internally. And so, falling down on his face, he will worship God and tell everybody that God is among you. Truth is powerful, but truth by definition excludes. Who 
do you, in your life, hold as the authority of truth? Glory be to God forever. Amen.